Good evening. I'm Jennifer Brown, Director of the Center for Literary Arts, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's reading by David I. First, let me say that the Center for Literary Arts events are made possible by the Allegheny Arts Council, the Community Trust Foundation, and several offices at Frostburg State University, including the Office of the President, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and the Department of English and Foreign Languages and Literature. Copies of I's book, Seed, uh, are available at Main Street Books. If you can't visit our favorite independent bookstore in person here in Frostburg, Fred and the other booksellers are always happy to make shipping or delivery arrangements with you. Uh, you can call the bookstore. David I's bio is filled with his accomplishments and accolades, but it also features my favorite line in any writer's biography that I've thus far read, which I feel compelled to share. Quote, I enjoyed a career in the theater. Before that, he spent four years in Texas in the military. This places him in an elite group of writer professors who have served in both the US Army and the Broadway tour of Cats, close quote. In an interview with Karen Cecile Davidson, which can be found on newfound.org, I said of Seed that the book isn't to my mind about being queer, the gay love poems made it in and the sex poems and breakup poems and poems about AIDS. I look at these as not being solely about my experience but as poems of witness. I was there responding specifically to a question about exploring queerness in art, but it strikes me that in one way or another, all of the poems in Seed are concerned with witnessing and observation, whether they open with an image from a photograph, from a seat on public transit, from a bar, or from a bird rich yard. As readers, our own eyes are implicated in this observation, and we're privy to these moments of heartbreak, of pleasure, of joy, of longing. I hope you'll join me in welcoming this evening, David I. Hi, I, I guess I'm on. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. Uh, this is the first of these that I've done. I've done Zooms and the old Skype, but never this version. So bear bear with my awkwardness. Um, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I, uh, first of all, want to thank, uh, first of all, um, uh, Jen for inviting me. I'd like to thank Dr. Armiento for giving her my book. And, but most of all, I'd like to uh, uh, thank my friend, Nicole, Nicole Helmus, who of course lives in Cumberland. Um, and first passed my book on to Dr. Armiento. So thank you all so much. And greetings, whoever's out there. Um, I am going to mute my face because it's just really annoying me. Um, uh, so uh, I'm gonna start with a poem by somebody else. I, um, uh, one of my teachers at, um, at Syracuse uh, Arthur Flowers would start his readings by uh, acknowledging the ancestors. And he would bring percussion instruments and do a little singing. I'm not gonna go that far, but I am gonna read or actually uh, um, recite a poem that uh, has been in my, my mind ever since I was an actor way, way back um, in, the, in the 80s. It is uh, Those Winter Sundays by Robert Hayden. Hayden is one of my poetic ancestors. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about ancestry, um, the various kinds of ancestors that we we have. Uh, and uh, yeah, so let me just uh, give you the poem and we'll go from there. Those Winter Sundays, Robert Hayden. Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. 
When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? Um, you won't hear as good a poem in the rest of the in the, in the hour. Uh, I just thought I would start, you know, <laughs> start that way. So I am going to read some wintry, snowy poems. Um, also, since we just survived Valentine's Day, uh, I, I will read some of those uh, some of those gay love poems that uh, <laughs> that Jen mentioned. Uh, I want to shout out to my family, whom I think might be watching, and friends maybe out in Texas where they're having the most bizarre weather ever, and they can, for once, actually relate to snow. Uh, it's crazy, crazy what's happening. I also, first of all, I keep saying first of all, I think, um, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate Black History Month. Um, I would probably have started with the Hayden poem uh, anyway. He is African-American, but definitely one of my poetic ancestors. Um, so, it occurred to me the other day, and I don't think anyone has else has said this, uh, at least not to my knowledge, but we hear all the time that Black history is American history. But it occurred to me that Black history is the American present. And I mean that in both senses of the word present. Uh, we're dealing with things now, we're rec having reckonings, um, but we're also uh the benefactors uh one can scarcely imagine american culture without black contributions without black culture um i'm going to read in a minute um a current uh poet's work uh jericho brown won the pulitzer in 2020 i had the great pleasure of uh of not only meeting him but uh reviewing his book for lambda literary and um uh he, I'm gonna gonna read one of his poems tonight. So let's um, let me jump in with something that I wrote. <laughs> Enough about all those other people. I don't have a podium in my house. I need to get a podium. <laughs> so this comes to you from the Catskills. I live in the mountains uh, outside of New York City, about two hours. And uh, this is called Letter from the Catskills. Cousin, when a dozen robins blew into the yard yesterday, I'd never seen so many. I watched them hop, cock their heads, grab the thaw's first worms. Such a pleasure, those yam-colored breast feathers. Then snow last night, enough for a fine white pelt, mostly gone by midday, you're better off doing your play in the city till it warms up for good. I wonder if the snow melted or, what's that word? Sublimed, to go from solid to gas, skipping liquid altogether, the way I'd like to die. Grocery shopping last night, I swear I felt like such a loser. Not a full set of teeth in the house, yet I'm the freak. 45, alone at the Liberty ShopRite and a snob. Can you believe it took four people to help me find capers? So many breakups. My sister got the only keeper. God, I love those kids. I dream of children almost every night. Awake, I'm a eunuch. New vocal warm up. repeat before you go on tonight. Unique New York eunuch, unique New York eunuch. Give your boy a squeeze. The robins are back. So uh, I think I will read Jericho's poem now. Uh, so I we we obviously we don't know who all is out there. I hope there's a bunch of students because I'm gonna I'm gonna geek out on some some prosody a little bit. Um, uh, so Jericho Brown's book that won the Pulitzer, I highly recommend. It is called The Tradition. He also is concerned with with ancestry, both personal and um, literary. Um, so he invented for this book uh, a form 
that he called the duplex. And it is a kind of hybrid of the sonnet, the guzzle, which is a Middle Eastern form, and the blues. And he sprinkles several of them in the book. I'm going to read the first one. And uh, you, you fellow poetry geeks, um, be listening for the repetition, the line repetition, and the subtle uh, changes, and what they do. Um, sometimes they reverse, sometimes they qualify, sometimes they get move from general to specific. Um, yeah, so anyway, here, Jericho Brown's, the, uh, it's just titled Duplex. A poem is a gesture toward home. It makes dark demands I call my own. Memory makes demands darker than my own. My last love drove a burgundy car. My first love drove a burgundy car. He was fast and awful, tall as my father. Steadfast and awful, my tall father hit hard as a hailstorm. He'd leave marks. Light rain hits easy but leaves its own mark like the sound of a mother weeping again. Like the sound of my mother weeping again. No sound beating ends where it began. None of the beaten end up how we began. A poem is a gesture toward home. Again, Jericho Brown from the tradition. Uh, we are acquainted, and I texted him today to let him know that that I was uh, going to include his poem, sort of a celebration of Black History Month, and uh, he was quite pleased and says hi to everyone. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to read a few poems, then we're going to talk a little bit, and then I'm going to read a few more poems. Um, the first few are from the book, uh, Seed. Um, and then I will read a few new ones and then a few old ones again. So good writing comes from good reading, students. Um, uh, and this is a case in point. I'm going back to the Hayden for a minute. I had a poem that was, as most of my poems are free verse, but this one was just too amorphous. It wasn't, wasn't working. Um, and then I came across Hayden's poem, The Whipping. And it's got a very strict meter, um, very strict, um, very regular form, I should say. And I thought, let me try to apply that to this poem of mine. To and I lifted entirely, lifted another in term um, in terms of form, numbers of stanzas, beats per line. And I think you'll see why this poem. I thought of the whipping when I wrote this poem. It's called Basement. Back in the cinder block corner beside the iron bed, the big man has cocked his arm and smacked the boy's face. Head down, his nose drips onto the bedspread he'd outgrown, dotting red the pale blue sea, a ship's wheel, twisted rope. He doesn't move or wipe, lets his nose leak Look what you did. This burning vessel. How to navigate. When the boy lifts his head, it's not the trail of blood across the lip, half a red mustache, and past the chin that strikes the man, but rather the eyes. You hit me again, I swear. Each studies the other. In the steady gaze, the man sees a boy slapped into manhood and doesn't touch him again. Here's a kind of, so all of, most of my love poems are, well, X love poems, or <laughs> there's uh, they're not quite dead on uh, love poems for sure. Um, 
this is called leavings. And uh, the 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 book, like my life, has gone goes back and forth between the city and the Catskills and past and present and uh, childhood and much more adult situations. This one, obviously, <clears throat> as you'll see, takes place in New York City. Leavings. December rain kicking up on itself from the New York Public Library steps. At the top, under cover, a paper shopping bag between us, radio, shirt, a book or two. I couldn't rest my eyes from its brown or think of anything else. Not Provincetown a year before. Cheating February, the fevered makeup. Not separate summer, or the chilly evening we left at intermission for pasta and the end at Ralph's on Ninth Avenue. In this mute epilogue, neither of us wants to leave or be left until he shifts and I grab the bag, take the stairs on a diagonal and two at a time past the stoic lions, all I am not, their faces awash in the unequivocal rain. So, let me lighten it up a little bit. Um, this is a kind of a kind of love poem, I would say. A blonde woman dances in a biker bar, a young mare or marionette, stringless, loose-limbed, mesmeric, barefoot on the barroom floor. I hope she has no man, not that I want to be hers. I only hope she lives without a man's weight. She sways light in cutoffs, sheer white blouse off the shoulder, long hair straight back to 68, pouring over and th lifted arms and hands, the band's efforts vindicated, purified by her body's ministrations. Something at the base of my neck stretches her direction, but my feet planted, leaden, help me, the band sings, I think I'm falling. How many know that what that song comes from? What song that comes from? <laughs> Some of us are old enough. Um, so the time being what it is, yeah, I think I'll read, um, yeah, I'll read uh, the, a couple of, speaking of Provincetown, um, a couple of poems from uh, a little triptych that I have. Um, I'm going to read, actually, I'm just going to read one. It's called Night for Night. And that refers to a film technique back uh, before modern filmmaking. Uh, night scenes were all shot during the day and then altered in ways uh, in post-production that made them look like night. But then with the advent of more modern equipment, um, they were able to shoot night scenes at night and they call it call that Night for Night. So there you go. And this is a rhymed, metered uh, sonnet. Scene, a downpour, bicycle, coastal town. Street lamps, rider's shirt is soaked to the skin. Heedless, he stops at a familiar lawn. Tight close up, he's watching them like a film. After their first sex scene with lidded eyes, one whispered he likes to watch the movies. Stay here, thought the other, but when he tried, he saw, even smelled, a stand of fir trees. One will leave the other for the desert, 30 mythic acres near Santa Fe. The sun, obscured by sky blue clouds at first, will slip out, waver, slide into the bay. Seven years on, this midnight mise-en-scene, a bike, a lawn, relentless summer rain. So I think it's time to read a piece of prose. Um, and then we'll take a little break and I hope that people have might chat might put some stuff in the chat and we can 
talk a little bit and then we'll come back and I'll read some more. Um, so this is also a kind of, it's not a poem, but it's a little, sh a short little story that uh, ends up being kind of a love letter to my mom. It's called A Mile in Her Shoes. By fourth or fifth grade, I must have proven myself a trustworthy boy. I would arrive home first after school around 3.30, giving me an hour, sometimes more, alone. I'd find a snack, Little Debbie oatmeal cakes, my favorite, and watch an hour of TV, Gilligan's Island and Dark Shadows. Or sometimes, if I knew I had enough time, I'd try on my mother's clothes. One afternoon in 1971, I was 11. My mom had her hair appointment. I wouldn't be home till 5.30. Dad, around five. I headed for the closet. I selected for the day's ensemble, a maxi skirt, chocolate brown with little crisscrosses of burnt orange and lime green, a wide elastic band at the top. I stripped to my underpants, put on my own red button up shirt, pulled the skirt on over it up to my armpits and stepped into mom's tall brown high heeled boots. The long sash that went with the skirt, I tied around my head and in order to further hide my crew cut, I topped it off with my red sailor cap and replaced my glasses with mom's brown plastic wraparound shades. I don't know what look I was going for, but I'm afraid I ended up somewhere between Rhoda and Gilligan. I sashayed around the house in this getup for a while until I was struck with the idea that to fully enjoy the experience, I should take a step outside. Just a step, onto the back stoop. No one would see, no one would know. So I opened the wooden door, then the storm door, and checking for neighbors, stepped out into the world, shutting the door behind me. The locked door. Strangely, I didn't panic but sat on the step to consider my options. Our basement had three short windows at ground level and back, and I had squeezed through the one above the washing machine before. But today, that window was locked, as were all the other windows and doors, front, back, and sides of the house. Everything locked tight. So since it didn't occur to me to smash a window, I had two remaining options. I could either sit on the stoop in a skirt and wait for my father, the cop, to come home. Or I could walk through my tiny southern town to the beauty parlor and get keys from my mother. I headed downtown. I struck out across our yard, and since no one was home from work yet, I made my way in high heel boots through the backyards of three neighbors, tidy half-acre lawns, each surrounding a one-story brick rancher. I passed under the tall oak trees in the sprawling Methodist church grounds, past the courthouse, sheriff's office, and county jail across the street on the right, and crossed Court Street. Here, I cut through a large vacant lot to avoid passers-by and the small clabbered houses on this block, their windows close to the sidewalk. A few hundred mincing steps on a back street, and I had reached Rosa Mays. I opened the door of the salon and strode in, by now confident of my complete disguise, when Mrs. Robinson, the shop manager, looked at me and said, David? I ignored her and made a beeline for my mother. She was under the dryer, my seven-year-old sister kneeling at her side. Rather than give myself away to the other ladies by saying, Mom, I said, Mrs. I? And asked for the keys. Without a word, she reached into her purse and handed them to me. I left the salon in my wake and retraced my steps. Unfazed by Mrs. Robinson's insight, when I got to my corner, I took the street instead of the backyards. On my left, the jail, sheriff's office, courthouse, the big church on the right, down the hill and past the neighbor's houses. But instead of walking all the way back up the hill to our driveway, in case anyone should be watching, I cut through the side yard on a diagonal and well behind our house, hung a sharp left toward the back door and safety. That night, just before bed, Mrs. I asked why I had dressed in her clothes. I told her 
I wanted to feel what it's like to be a girl. An answer she seemed to accept. Though she did advise me not to do it again. And she said we should tell my sister, who had, of course, recognized me right away, that I'd done it on a dare. There was no small town scandal and no repercussions, even inside that house on Morton Lane, because my father never found out. And my mother, to whom I am grateful for taking it in stride, kept that skirt and sash, but no recollection of the event whatsoever. The story has an addendum, though I might be making it up. My father, the cop, died in November 2018. Late in his life, after my mom divorced him, after he faced some demons and took some meds, my dad softened into the man we, and perhaps he, wished he'd been all along. My parents had many long, frank talks then about their marriage and about me and my sister, whom he had not gotten to know when we were young. Sitting on the back deck, cocktails in hand, my mom told my dad about the day I locked myself out and walked through town in her clothes, and they laughed and laughed and laughed. So let's open it up. If you got any uh, comments to share or names or. Well, I've, I've put some uh, comments, David, oh, into in the chat. our chat. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Hi, Cindy. And Michelle and Anne and Nicole and Heather. This is awesome. I'm reading, sorry. <laughs> Including my friend Claudia in German. Professor, here is dein Liebchen. Du bist wunderbar. <laughs> thank you, Liebchen. Uh, oh my gosh, thank you guys. Oh, wow, Linda, Terry. Um, wow. One for Joni Mitchell, you got it, Anne. And the other Anne, Fitzsimmons. Uh, oh, sweet. So any um, opening up the floor sort of for any questions or uh, any about anything um, at all? I just wanted to take a little little pause there before going back to some poems. Well, uh, because we don't have a, a formal question yet in the chat, uh, I am going to raise what uh, what might seem like an intrusive question, but given what you've just read and given opening with uh, those winter Sundays, uh, so seed features rather than exactly a page of acknowledgements um, and uh, I am grateful for list, uh, which is a move that I love. I, I thought that was um, a very open hearted way of opening the book. Um, but it struck me that the last entry is uh, that my, my dad is no longer recognizable as the father figure in these poems. And, and a curiosity that I had was if that expresses a gratitude for your having come to like a differently constructed father persona in the poems, or if it signals you're having come to a different understanding of your father. Uh, so thank you. That's that is such a great question, and 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 thank you for doing the thing that I meant to do. I always feel compelled in readings in which I talk about my dad, or that I read poems about my dad, because we did have a rough time of it for many years. Uh, but toward the end of his life, we had some really good years. Um, and by the time the book came out, he had really transformed. Uh, he had gotten a personality transplant. <laughs> um, and, but it's interesting that you should ask because I did, that all happened after I had let go of the need for him to be a certain kind of father. Um, and now we're getting all Freudian and stuff, but, uh, but yes, yeah, so it was almost concurrent. Like I, I gave it up and then through his work and to his great credit, I think he became a different person. And we, we had some, again, some very good, good years. Uh, and so I felt compelled to put that in the book because in the acknowledgements as you, as you say, 
because I wanted to be honest in the book about the things that happened with my dad, but also wanted people to know that he wasn't like that anymore. Uh, I will also tell you that I printed a special edition for him that left some of those things out because he didn't need to go back there or I didn't need him to go back there. So great question. Thank you. Uh, any questions? If not, I'll keep going. Let's see. You have a um, you have a couple other comments. I'm just going to bring over if I can. Okay. Three to see. And there they are. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris and Philip and Shirley I, a proud Mo. Mom, I guess she, that, that <laughs> she left her out. And she doesn't even know why I'm laughing. Oh, that was her. Okay. That was Jennifer. <laughs> um, my mom is a mom. Uh, she's not a Mo. She doesn't probably even know this abbreviation, but Mo is short for homo. So yeah, anyway. <laughs> Uh, thank you everyone for your comments. Let me jump before I further embarrass myself. Let me jump back into, um, into some reading. I'm going to read a few, uh, new pieces, um, newer, I should say, um, uh, that are not published. Uh, don't, I, I, my, most of my artistic attention, if you will, since, well, for a while now couple years has been directed mostly um, toward a musical I'm writing. Um, and it's a completely different use of myself. And I'm having to both learn, uh, research the history that this event that I'm dramatizing is based on and learn how to write a musical. So I'm, I'm studying books, I'm studying musicals, um, and, uh, and pardon me. Um, but anyway, here are some some poems, um, some newer poems, again, having to do in one way or another with uh, ancestry, a couple of them. Um, I feel like we have three way three kinds of ancestry, at least as writers or artists, we, um, we have our poetic or our literary lineage, right, or artistic lineage. I prefer ancestry or lineage to influence. Um, I like talking about it in, in those terms better. Of course, we have our, you know, ancestry.com kind of ancestry. We have our our blood lineage as well. And 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 I feel like there's a kind of collective ancestry that we aren't just who we are because of our genetics. Uh, and our little insular family, we are who we are because of the a wider and wider and wider circles, not just in the present, but going way back. Um, which is again, why I, I'm, I, I think that black history is the American present. Um, this is a poem that I hope to will be in a series of poems that, uh, use the made object, the crafted object as a way into a larger issue. And so far, um, the series is called Threads. I, I'm old enough that I look back with, you know, a fair amount of longing for some of my old clothes. <laughs> this is called, uh, a, a, the series will be called Threads. There was this Western shirt, cotton muslin, with nubs and flecks, the yoke a patchwork of purple, blue, and green. More hippie than cowboy. I grew out of it or ruined it with sweat, and yet I wish I had that shirt. It was 1975 or six, too late and I too young for Woodstock. And a teen Republican. But there was this fat book my cop dad confiscated on a drug raid. 
a manifesto for the underground, the movement. I kept it squirreled away in my desk drawer. America spelled with a K, all the policemen depicted as pigs. Thick as the phone book of the city I'd moved to. There were photos in black and white, white people with stringy hair, black people with afros and raised fists, pictures I'd never seen, black and white people holding hands, piecing together something new. I think I'm going to skip this one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a few Tonka, um, just three. They're so short. They are, uh, as I said to a friend of mine on Facebook uh, who had not heard of the, the form, they're like haiku on hormones. They are, it's a five line uh, form alternating between five and seven syllables per line. Um, they let me, for some reason, talk about spirituality. I, I don't know why exactly, but but most of the ones I've written have lent themselves to that. Um, I, uh, I'm really lucky. I have this little cottage that this is coming to you from in the Catskills, and I spend a great deal of my summer out on my back porch, and I sleep out there. Um, and so you need to know that when, when you hear some of this. Help me, God, I said. And a wind picked up and teased the trees, and a voice said, Be like them. It was my voice. It said, Stand still. Said, Sway. These strangers who sit beside us in bars and touch their wings to ours. We'd forgotten, fixed as they are, to the backbones of our hearts. Mornings I wake up in a cathedral of trees. I can't hear God's voice for the creek, but maybe God is in the creek saying, shh. Uh, one more newish one. Uh, I have to, to read more in this genre. There's a subgenre of poetry, um, the jazz poem. And I haven't read a lot of them. So I have this as a disclaimer. But the ones that I did read back in grad school, the ones I remember were all by white guys. And they seem to be more about hero worship than about the music, about the art. Uh, I'm sure there are exceptions, and I know there's, I know there's whole books of, of fantastic uh, jazz poems by black writers, etc. But the ones that I was exposed to, um, just rubbed me the wrong way. Kind of like with 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 sports, when it becomes more about uh, hero worship again than about the sport. By the way, my family, huge sports fans. I'm not including you <laughs> in that. Um, so that's all I have to say, I think. Oh, except that my friend, uh, Anne with an E, Anne Fitzsimmons, I was with her at a jazz club, uh, she and her husband. Uh, and for the first time, I really felt compelled to respond to the music in some way. So here we go. It's still in process. So uh, the working title is just jazz poem. I've done the thing I thought I'd never do. I've written a jazz poem. Because the jazz poems I know by white guys worship and idolize, the poet prostrate before the hero and his horn, so mostly I've thought the poet should try blowing the sax player and we'd have one less jazz poem and one more happy jazz player. But I'm writing this jazz poem because here in this jazz club, the saxophone is the squawk of a jay and the piano the tree or the piano a garden 
and the sacks a plow. The base has lines that are furrows and I am following them all the way back to my great grandparents who threshed and danced and I can't not move to the beat and the off beat and every time the drummer's stick splashes against the sizzle cymbal, thousands of seeds scatter in the hot blue Virginia wind. And one more new one, um, response to the turmoil of last spring, as if a health pandemic weren't enough, then we had uh, the news um, and George Floyd murder. And I was two hours from New York City and feeling pretty darn worthless in terms of showing any kind of support, resistance, anything. And this is an attempt to enter the conversation. It is called Obad, A-U-B-A-D-E, and Obad is simply a, a poem set in the morning, usually at dawn. Often uh, it is spoken from the departing lover to the lover he or she is leaving behind, but not always. And cl clearly, as you'll see, not the case with this one. <clears throat> Obad. Spring 2020. At first light, they start. Removed by two hours from New York, I am useless, a mute witness to the latest scourge. From my laptop, digital images and sounds of the breathless, the dying, the voices of millions gathered in revolt, the news collects inside like the heat of day, and at night I escape to the porch where it's cool, and I slide into sleep. Morning brings birdsong. From my perch amid the trees, only the screen between me and the world. A catbird with its meandering melody, then a robin. A distant veery spirals its song. A wood thrush downhill its fluting cousin, whistle of a cardinal nearby. So many, a chorus, a throng. I don't know all their names, Oriole, Tanager, Wren. Their names, there are so many. Brianna, the sound of eight shots, a mod, George, who cried, Mama. Tamir, Freddy, Sandra, on and on. They are loud in my head. They echo through time and the forest. They drown out the creek. It is not yet 5 a.m. I am saying their names. Checking the time. All right, I'm going to... Zoom through a few more poems, and then we'll have a few minutes to, to chat, I hope. Um, please feel free to, to leave questions or whatever. Um, let's see. Here's a snow poem that is also a love poem. Isn't it great when snow and romance can collide? <laughs> it's called Winter Hike. And uh, it is set uh, in, um, I think it's Harriman Park, definitely Bear Mountain. I think that's Harriman Park, uh, just north of New York City. But I say just about an hour and a half north of New York City, which will make sense in a minute. Winter Hike. A narrow packed trail drifts two feet deep on either side will remain weeks past the spring thaw, a spine along the mountain's back, meandering reminder. In a bottom, a pool topped with gray-green ice the color of your eyes. Brook gurgling, unseen beneath fine lines in a sheer translucent layer. You knew the way, but I knew the trees. The beach's smooth gray trunks their rows of shivering leaves like paper sparrows. 
white pine and another kind. On the barren rise, all stone and glare and New York City, improbable in the distance. Ahead, hemlock shadows feathered across the snow, ours moving among them. An impossible blue sky, a first kiss, and the glisten. This is going out to my family, my dear family, and uh, including including my cousin, whom I saw uh, in the chat. Uh, it is called Crossing. It is one of the very first poems I wrote in, in Provincetown at the Fine Arts Work Center. Uh, kept working on it, hammering it into shape with my beloved uh, thesis advisor, Brooks Haxton at Syracuse. Um, I worked on it, I wrote it with Robin Becker, whom I recommend if you don't know her work. Um, wonderful, wonderful teacher now retired from Penn State. And great poet. <clears throat> Crossing. Late the night my grandmother died, I dreamed. I walked beneath the pillowed sky alone. Through wheat fields quilted white. The fences, seams. I headed for the woods instead of home. The cold, the light, the late November snow made ground and sky so bright they hurt my eyes. Or was it something lost? I didn't know. But in the dream I cried, or tried to cry. I knew I'd never make it to the woods. I had to catch a boat back to a feast. Many strangers, tables laden with food. I leaned from door to door, but didn't eat. When I awoke, her absence was a wound that bloomed inside my chest and filled the room. Uh, I think I think I'm going to close um, with the following, with one one more poem, and then we can we can chat. Uh, hopefully, people will have things to say. <laughs> to say. Uh, it's the last poem I wrote before the book was published. It's the last poem in the book. Uh, I just want to again thank you so much. Uh, uh, Frostburg State University and Jennifer, thank you for having me. I so appreciate it. And thank thank you all of you out there, who and wherever you are. Um, and to you students, keep track of your texts because sometimes you might get a poem out of one of them. I uh, We had a blizzard in New York, quote unquote blizzard. It didn't mount to much really uh, a few years back. And I was living in the city then in the East Village. And the next day was just the most spectacular, clear, cold, but clear day with the sky so blue. And, and I texted something to a friend of mine and he texted me back and said, can I have that? And I said, no. And it became the last two lines of this poem. So <laughs> you just never know. As New York snow. By two o'clock, the snowstorm had begun its diagonal attack on windows overlooking East 7th. Inside, low hum of the fridge. Hard to tell when the sun went down. The night sky retained a special glower. Crystals, infinitesimal mirrors, falling, reflect who we are. Sky, the color of burn. Nothing here is pure. But in the morning, upper branches lace themselves in a graceful matrix. Ivy, firmly woven onto the fire escape, shivers a little less in the rising slant of the sun. This day will be clean. Let us meet in the sober and snow-swept light.
David, thank you so much for reading that poem, uh, which I gave to my students. And uh, it's so nice to hear it in your breath. Thank you. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you. Thank um, there are a few questions from the chat uh, right. that I'd just like to pass on to you. Uh, so one comes from Nicole Halmas. Um, so she writes, one of the things I love about David's work is the specificity of the images. In a word or two, are they the impetus and an actual recollection or do you work on those for a specific effect? It really varies. You know, sometimes the word, the line, like in that last poem, the let us meet in the sober and snow swept light was literally what I texted uh, my friend. So sometimes the language comes first, but then other times it has to be beaten a little harder uh, uh, because I'm always trying to trying to be true whether or not I'm factual. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying to recreate an experience for somebody, for a reader, uh, trying to find the best way to do that and usually the most economical way to do that. And sometimes it's it's language that comes first. Sometimes uh, it's the feeling that I try to name with 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 language. I hope that that answers the question. We won't know until she says yes. <laughs> Uh, there's also a question here from Michael Rogan. Uh, musical. Hi, Michael. Uh, how is writing lyrics different or same from poetry for you? Uh, not to mention writing the book. Are you working with a composer? I am so far in my head. I'm writing the lyrics and book and I will collaborate with a composer. Uh, I, I have some melodies have come, but they might go out the window when I have a collaborator. Uh, Michael, really good question. And I have had to answer that question for myself. I am still learning from Mr. Sondheim, actually, uh, in his, he has a couple of books that collect his, uh, I, you're watching the time? I'm, okay, good, we're good. Um, according to Stephen Sondheim, lyrics, because they have music under them, can be in a way flatter then flatter that's with a t then a poem a, a poetry lyric that has to carry its own music that has to be its own music he says it's really easy to overwrite a lyric because you're trying to be artful but what but they're functional that and that is that's been hard for me uh, to, you know to realize um it's it's both simpler and harder. It's simpler language, but kind of harder to, uh, so far anyway, to keep remembering that. Because uh, you want to jump to metaphor and you want to jump to uh, sound, but you don't need it. Um, you just you just need them to function as they need to in, in the musical. Uh, did I get all of his questions? He's going to be writing lyrics to poetry. Yes. On the book, I don't know. I'm first time attempt so far dialogue has been really fun and coming pretty naturally i or so i hope and you know 17 years as an actor i'm sure is working its way in at some point somehow others Well, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hop in with another question for you, David, if you don't mind. Um, so your uh, your MTA, you have a series of MTA poems uh, in the book, and uh, MTA three, Cross Town Bus, is uh, I have to say one of the most successful villanelles that I've read recently. Oh, thank um, you. And it really struck me that at how successful that was, huh. um, because it has to do with that kind of spiraling nature of the form and also the content of, of being almost unhinged. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I was curious about how you kind of came to that form with that poem and what really pushed the villain, villanelle uh, in your choices. I 
remember quite clearly just writing out the story of it, writing out the event, the kind of narration of what I observed. And it felt like a gift because she had these three things, the wallet, the compact, and I guess, uh, well, the compact, and I guess maybe the last thing is the, is the mind. I feel like there were three, three objects, but they have hinges. And so I found language, you know, when I went back and looked at my notes, there were just these, these, there were some repetitions in there. And so I just thought, well, gosh, let me see if, if this could bear, you know, the weight, the pressure of the villanelle. Uh, it's the only one I've written. Uh, and thank you for that. And it actually was the first poem I ever um, got published, thanks to Renee Soto at, uh, um, the, it, they don't have it anymore, but Roger was the name of the publication um, from Roger Williams University. Uh, but yeah, it came came from the the situation. There's there's also one one last comment that I haven't transferred into our chat, uh, which comes from Beth Ryan, uh, which is this has been a beautiful way to spend an evening, uh, and and I couldn't agree more. Um, oh, thank you so much. Oh oh oh! Actually, there's one more. Um, so considering ancestry and honoring Black lives, do you feel your poetry and poets and their work in general? has a responsibility today? And if so, what is it? Who asked the question? I'm just um, Luis Rivera. Okay. Um, uh, so one more time. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you, so uh, do you feel your poetry and poets and their work in general uh, has a responsibility? I do. I don't know myself. I'm still finding ways like that one poem is it finding ways into the conversation. I do think that it's not just writers of color whose responsibility, who has the responsibility to be having the conversation. I think that, that, that non writers of color, white people have to be um, in the mix, have to, I don't think everybody has to try to write about, about race. I don't think that's, it's not everybody's kind of job on the on the earth, but I feel like there is a, a responsibility to at least to find some way, whether it's their own work or someone else's, to 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 be to be in it, to be doing the work. Um, well, and and on that note, then. Uh... So to echo Beth, Beth again, uh, David, thank you so much for, uh, for your work and for this lovely reading and uh, for being with us. Jen, thank you so much again. And thanks to everybody out there. I wish I could see you all, but I wish I could hug you all, but <laughs> soon enough. Thank you so much, Jen. I really appreciate it.